This is a very different administration than the United States has had in the past. Russia is modernizing their heavy bombers to launch the advanced KH-101 and 102 cruise missiles recently used in the conventional variant of this uh, weapon in support of combat operations in Syria. China is also... ...as well during this period. ...is modernizing their heavy bombers to launch the advanced KH-101 and 102 cruise missiles recently used in the conventional variant of this uh, weapon in support of combat operations in Syria. China is also expanding and diversifying their strategic forces at the same time. Our adversaries are building and operate these strategic weapons, not as a science experiment, but as a direct threat to the United States of America. And we must respond to the threat. What shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts, this know also, that in the last days, perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. From such turn away, for of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Jannes and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. What benefit do I get in believing we went to the moon? What go. benefit? Is it going to benefit me? Dude, you've been fucking fooled. Everyone's been fooled. Think about all the lies. The lies go deep. The rapture. The virtuous have gone to heaven and the rest of us have been left below. <gasps> left below? We were fools. And because we rejected God, tacitly accepting Satan, we must suffer through the apocalypse. Why did I put my faith in science and technology? remained in emergency session late into the night debating the president's call for martial law. We have in this country a tradition of invoking yeah, martial law it. only when the most dire of circumstances require it. But at what cost? All eyes now turn to New York City to see if martial law will bring the terror to an end. So he was, in her telling, she said that we were at the end of time and that, uh, that this was the final, this, this Illuminati was in charge now, head Illuminati guy, whatever, the head guy, I can't remember what she called him, um, the master, she called him the master, that he was the last one before the final one who would become the Antichrist. He was going to sit in the empty 13th throne. All right, this is kind of a continuation of a previous video. Uh, I thought I would go ahead and tell you the whole story of the time I met an MK Ultra trainer. So uh, I was a preacher at a pretty large church. A woman came to our church, uh, wanted to get involved in the church. Um, 
but a weird thing happened. The bishop in charge kind of snubbed her and wouldn't let her get involved in the church, which is kind of uncharacteristic for him. So I asked him about it. He was pretty cryptic about why, and he actually did tell me that it's because he felt like she had mental issues and he couldn't go into it. So uh, I didn't think anything more of it. A couple weeks later, I was at a, a big seminar with a bunch of, of clergy. It was um, open to anyone who paid the fee to get into it, but uh, it was primarily a clergy convention, uh, a series of seminars, multiple day thing. So like on day one, uh, I encountered this woman in the lobby. She came up to me and wanted to tell me why she was not part of our church and what had happened with her and the pastor. So I was curious and I gave her a listen. And the story that she told me was mind boggling. It was beyond belief and I could see totally why the pastor would think she was crazy. So um, I went ahead and gave her the time kind of out of morbid curiosity. And you know, at the end of this four hours I spent with this woman, I decided if she was crazy, she was the most special kind of crazy I'd ever seen. That her craziness was so detailed and in depth that honestly it made me believe her story even though it was totally unbelievable. And since then I have stayed away from the topic of MK Ultra because, uh, and even the Illuminati and a lot of this stuff I don't delve too deeply into uh, because it does sound so crazy. But let me just tell you as best I can remember the story this woman told me. So she claims to have been born in the Illuminati from a Illuminati Bavarian family who can trace their origins very all the way back to the beginning of the Bavaria version of the, the Illuminati, which is the ones that are supposed to be, you know, at the Grove and, you know, the, the, the supposed to be the, the Bilderbergers and all of this. So she claims that she had a relatively normal childhood, although she was raised mostly by other people because they were very wealthy and that she had gone to, you know, uh, uh, you know, where they off to parochial school or whatever, not parochial school, but private school, and that she didn't live at home and didn't know her parents much until she was 13. When she was 13, she was taken, she says, to Rome, where they walked through a series of catacombs under the city and hallways and passageways underground until they ended up in an Illuminati uh, room, uh, like a, a, a cathedral or a, or a satanic church. And she claims that the Illuminati are Satanists, that this is all about Satanism. And uh, what she described was a big giant round area with 13 thrones encircling this area. And the 13th throne was empty. The 12th throne is where the head Illuminati members sat. And the previous 11 thrones were occupied by the dead bodies of previous heads of the Illuminati. So he was, in her telling, she said that we were at the end of time and that, uh, that this was the final, this, this Illuminati who was in charge now, head Illuminati guy, whatever, the head guy, I can't remember what she called him, um, the master, she called him the master, that he was the last one before the final one who would become the Antichrist. He was going to sit in the empty 13th throne. So... In this circle, she said, was a pentagram and candles, and she was laid on a ceremonial uh, altar at the center of this. And then while everyone watched, this large group, including her family, she was um, raped by this, well, she gave herself willingly to this 12th um, master who uh, impregnated her with her first child in that ceremony, where she lost her virginity and was impregnated. Um, she said that she had just started her period a couple, a few months earlier and that that's why they took her there and that when they took her there, she was fertile. So she was inseminated by this guy in this ceremony and that her son was very special because she was the son of the master or he was the son of the master rather. And she was chosen because she was of a pure bloodline that went back to royalty in Bavaria. So flash forward, she's given an arranged marriage. Uh, to a, a slightly older man. I think um, she was 14, 13 or 14 when they got married. And uh, I don't believe they were married in the States. They were married in another country. I think it may be Germany. Um, at any rate, her and her husband were trained and had a job in the Illuminati and they were MK Ultra trainers. 
and their life was very interesting that they would um, they would just be asleep and living this normal life and they would get a phone call and this phone call would give them their trigger word because they'd been brainwashed and their personalities had been split so during the rest of the time this lady thought she was just a housewife you know just a soccer mom and her husband was just a guy that you know uh, worked at the police force he was a cop and um, she said that they would get this call in the middle of the night I asked her if this was the United States government and she said no this is above the United States government this is the people that all the governments uh, report to and I struggled to understand it 11 years ago LT thank God you're here the government's putting subliminal messages in your videos subliminal messages you have any idea how insane that sounds is that a Navy tattoo they would just be asleep and living this normal life and they would get a phone call and this phone call would give them their trigger word because they'd been brainwashed and their personalities had been split so during the rest of the time this lady thought she was just a housewife you know just a soccer mom and her husband was just a guy that you know uh, worked at the police force he was a cop and um, she said that they would get this call in the middle of the night and be given a code word where, where they would snap out of this false persona and become the MK Ultra Illuminati trainers that they both were. They would wake their kids up because their kids were also in this torture program becoming MK Ultra slaves. And they would go to an undisclosed location in a rural environment underneath these giant tents, these giant white like FEMA tents. And um, I asked her if this was the United States government and she said no this is above the United States government. This is this is the people that all the governments uh, report to. And I struggled to understand it 11 years ago. And so anyway, she says um, that they would then engage in torturing other candidates and that they themselves didn't torture their own children, other people did it. But they would torture children and young adults and uh, they would use this torture to split their personalities and be able then to be like them so a code word would snap them out of their fake life and back into the reality of who they were and that these people uh, some of them were there against their will were, were literally kidnapped and done this to on a regular basis um, so at first she was in charge of torturing and it was her job to torture other people and I, I tried to probe her heart about how that made her feel and I could see that at one time she had no conscience but at some point she grew one so you know it, was, it bothered her now but she admitted that it was her job then and didn't bother her a bit that it was part of what the big picture was so they would train these people and when they got them to where they could turn them on and off like that then they would start giving them weapons training martial arts training firearms training and eventually she was promoted out of torture into firearms training and she claimed to be an expert firearms uh, uh, firearms expert and being a gun guy myself, I queried her during those four hours, and I believe that she was very well knowledgeable, um, even more knowledgeable than I am about military-grade weapons. She knew a lot about automatic weapons and the various uh, forms they come in. So, <clears throat> at any rate, being a curious guy and being a little scared, but from her from her story, you know, I went straight to, okay, so what is the end game? What, why are you training all these people? What do you intend to do with them? And she, in no uncertain terms, said, Oh, they're going to overthrow every government on earth and create a one world government and take over. We've been planning it for hundreds of years. And uh, it took a long time to build the infrastructure. And we've been training around the clock. Now, keep in mind, this is 11 years ago. She said, We've been training around the clock. She said, We may only train once or twice a month, but there's somebody training somewhere every night. And that there are thousands and thousands and thousands of MK Ultra uh, mind control slaves who are trained assassins who live amongst ordinary people and are, uh, in fact, completely unaware most of the time of who they really are until they're woken up. And uh, that the way I said, well, how do they how are they going to roll this out? You know, the American people aren't going to stand for this. What about you know the National Guard and the veterans? And she said, they have no idea what's coming for them. When we do this, it's going to happen so fast. And I said, well, tell me how it goes. And she said, okay, here's the plan. The plan is there will be some event or series of events that will create so much chaos in the world, so much uh, that even the police, I said, what about the police? You know, she said, the police uh, will stay home. 
It will be so bad that the police will say, I did not sign up for this, and they won't go. And the ones that do go will easily be taken out by our army. And I said, well, what's going to happen? I mean, are you going to be wearing American uniforms? Is this American military? And she goes, no. She says, in the middle of this chaos, in the middle of the um, fog of war, when everyone thinks everything's gone completely haywire, then suddenly you'll see these forces just emerge, all dressed in black, all dressed in SWAT gear. She said they will uh, be driving, you know, uh, all look-alike black SUVs, and they will look and sound and act very official. And they will just simply claim that they are now in charge, and everyone should do as they say. They will claim that they are part of a new government that has been uh, established for the purpose of dealing with the said situation. And that the police would either work with them or be quickly eliminated if they didn't. And that the military is not going to get involved because they follow orders and no one's going to give them an order to get involved. That that order will never come. And that they will simply transfer their allegiance from the United States Army to the new world government that will emerge. And she made it sound like it could literally happen overnight. But I think I gathered from it that it was a process that would accumulate with them taking charge at some point. Just physically showing up as the guys with the guns and the cars and the official looking uniforms. And uh, the whole thing was the creepiest encounter I ever had. And there's the whole story. You have any idea how insane that sounds? Is that a Navy tattoo? A Navy tattoo? You have any idea how insane that sounds? <gasps> Lieutenant Smash! Yeah, that's right. Lieutenant L.T. Smash. A wig! But, but your pant legs! Ugh. Oh. How could you soil the good name of Star Blitz Promotions? Oh, come on, Lisa. We've always used pop stars to recruit people. Going back to Elvis. Then there was Sergeant Peppers, the Captain and Tennille, and the Kiss Army. But you have recruiting ads on TV. Why do you need subliminal messages? Uh, it's a three-pronged attack. Subliminal, liminal, and superliminal. Superliminal? I'll show you. <laughs> hey, you! Join the Navy! Uh, yeah, all right. I'm in. On December 6th, President Trump's words shook the world. He recognized Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, and whether he knows it or not, fulfilled his part in a frightening biblical prophecy. Because according to the final chapters of the Bible, our country and every American citizen are about to face its greatest tribulation. Only the church leaders know the true meaning of this biblical prophecy that is encrypted in the writings of four ancient prophets, inspired to send a warning across the centuries to all true Christians and patriots. Therefore, before watching this documentary, be forewarned. You are about to see how all the world's leaders and their armies are silently playing their part in the lead up to the greatest and darkest event in human history. An event that may leave 290 million Americans dead in its wake. Once you witness the chilling evidence of the words of our Lord coming true, there is no turning back. It will simply be impossible for you to go about your daily life like you used to before knowing the truth. But take comfort, for it is God's will that you are here now so that you may have the time to prepare and maybe grant you salvation from all the wickedness of our times. And if you're feeling skeptical right now, let me ask you one question. Who would have thought 70 years ago that the Jewish people would have a country to call their own? Only those who read Ezekiel chapter 37. That is what the prophet wrote 2,700 years ago. The hand of the Lord was on me and set me in the middle of a valley it was full of bones. Then he said to me, These bones are the people of Israel, my people. I will take the Israelites out of the nations where they have gone. I will gather them from all around and bring them back into their own land. I will make them one nation in the land on the mountains of Israel. Word by word, the prophecy made by Ezekiel came true. 
In 1947, the nation of Israel was born after the horror of the Holocaust, symbolized by the Valley of Bones. Scattered for more than 2,000 years, the Jewish people come from all over the world into this new state and made it an economic and military power. Yet, it was not whole. Israel needed Jerusalem to become its rightful capital again, and that only happened with the support of President Trump. However, to the north of Israel, other biblical prophecies have come true. The prophets Isaiah and Jeremiah write about this Syrian civil war. This is what the prophet Isaiah says, Damascus will no longer be a city, but will become a heap of ruins. And these are the words of Jeremiah. Damascus has become feeble. She has turned to flee, and panic has gripped her. Anguish and pain have seized her. Surely her young men will fall in the streets. For 5,000 years, the capital city of Syria stood as one of the oldest and most prosperous cities in the world. But the civil war began in 2011 and turned it into a ruin. Not only do the prophets talk about the war, but also the refugee crisis and the deaths of its men fighting for one side or the other. The army of Syrian dictator Bashar al-Assad has been fighting the rebels backed by the United States, Israel, Turkey, Jordan and Saudi Arabia, and ISIS terrorists. In 2015, Bashar al-Assad was at the brink of total defeat. Yet exactly at that time, another biblical prophecy was fulfilled. Ezekiel 38 tells of Russia coming to the border of Israel. The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog. I will turn you around, put hooks in your jaws, and bring you out with your army. In the latter years, you will come into the land of those brought back from the sword and gathered from many people on the mountains of Israel. One only has to look at the map of the world as it was known at the time of the prophet to understand. To the north of the Caspian Sea, we find the people known as Magog, inhabiting the land known as Rosh. Over time, the ancient name of Rosh became current-day Russia. Twice, Ezekiel says that Magog will bring his armies from the extreme north to the border of Israel. None other than President Ronald Reagan, a devout Christian, said many times he truly believed Russia to be Magog according to Ezekiel. What about the word Gog? Bible scholars agree that the word Gog is not an actual name, but a title. He is the ruler of the land of Magog, like a king or a czar. Ezekiel clearly says that Russia will come to the mountains of Israel in the latter years. This happened in September 2015 and never before. For the first time in history, the Russian army, navy, and air force became involved in a war in the Middle East. According to Ezekiel, Magog's armies has several allies, Persia, Kush, and Gomer and Togarma. Iran has been known as Persia for much of its history during the time of the prophets and beyond. Right now, Iranian troops are on the ground in Syria, fighting side by side with the Russians and the forces loyal to the regime of Bashar al-Assad. Put and Kush are the ancient names of Libya and Egypt. Egypt and Libya both suffered civil wars, and the new leadership is very friendly to the Russians. But the greatest surprise is the land known to Ezekiel as Gomer and Togarma. The historian Flavius Josephus references Togarma and Gomer as the people that lived on the territory of present-day Turkey. In fact, Turkish history books identify these tribes as living on their land at the time of the prophets. Three years ago, Turkey was a strong NATO ally, but everything changed after the failed coup attempt in 2016. Now, Turkey has become increasingly hostile to NATO and the United States. It forced NATO to remove forces from its bases. It's buying weapons from Russia. It fully condemned the idea of Jerusalem becoming the capital of Israel. And in fact, right now, the Turkish army is in Syria, fighting to defeat the enemies of the Syrian dictator. The End Times Alliance, prophesied in the first verses of Ezekiel chapter 38, has already been formed. Never in the history of mankind 
Has there been an alliance between Russia, Iran, and Turkey? Now, one final prophecy needs to be fulfilled before the start of World War III. We saw how Jeremiah predicted the destruction of Damascus in chapter 49, but there is one more thing he wrote about that has not happened yet. And I will kindle a fire in the wall of Damascus, and it shall consume the palaces of Ben-Hadad. Ben-Hadad is not an actual person, but a title. Just do one simple search online, and you will discover that Ben-Hadad is the ruler of Aram Damascus. While it is clear that Bashar al-Assad is the current ruler of Damascus, Aram is a region in Syria now known as Aleppo. The city of Aleppo was just recently recaptured by the regime of Syrian President Bashar al-Assad with the help of Iran and Russia. And Jeremiah says that soon his palace will be burning. How does this happen? Look no further than the headlines of recent months, and you see time and time again Israel calling for the assassination of the Syrian dictator. Isaiah also writes about the end of Syria's dictator. The fortified city will disappear from Ephraim and royal power from Damascus. This is the spark that ignites World War III. Ezekiel chapter 38 states that two-thirds of Israel will be destroyed in this coming war, and those left in the Holy Lands will face grief and pain and hardship. So what happens to the United States? Will we not help Israel at its darkest hour? To answer this question, we must first find the United States in biblical prophecy. John the Apostle in the book of Revelation and Jeremiah and Isaiah Talk about another end times nation in their writings. A nation called Babylon, or Mystery Babylon. The name is deeply symbolic. Ancient Babylon was a city made great by people who came from all parts of the ancient world, just like immigrants helped make the United States the world's only superpower. And because the prophets didn't know of the existence of the North American continent at the time of the visions, they called it Mystery Babylon. Some say Biblical Babylon refers to ancient Iraq. But if that is true, why do the prophets see it as a nation surrounded by waters? O thou that dwellest upon many waters, abundant in treasures, where all who had ships on the sea became rich through her wealth, while Biblical Babylon has plentiful access to waters rich in resources, most of Iraq is a desert and has only a narrow stretch of coastline. Why do the prophets talk about pollution when in ancient Iraq there could be no such thing? Thou hast destroyed thy land. I have polluted mine inheritance and have given them into thine hand. If war happens, the United States must be the first target. That is why the prophets foretell that at the start of this war, Russia will unexpectedly use a very special weapon, the weapon of indignation, against the whole territory of the U.S., a weapon like which the world has never seen. The Holy Book shows how Babylon will feel the fury of this terrible weapon. This weapon will hit our entire country and all our defenses will be in vain. Though Babylon should mount up to heaven, and though she should fortify the height of her strength, Yet the spoilers come unto her. This weapon paralyzes our military and leaves it almost defenseless. How is the hammer of the whole earth cut asunder and broken? The mighty men of Babylon have forborne to fight. Their might hath failed. The broad walls of Babylon shall be utterly broken, and her high gates shall be burned with fire. She hath given her hand. Her foundations are fallen. Her walls are thrown down, because the spoiler is come upon her, even upon Babylon. And her mighty men are taken, every one of their bows is broken. And after the attack, Babylon is left silent and in darkness. Sit thou silent, and get thee into darkness, for thou shalt no more be called the Lady of Kingdoms. It is obvious that Babylon, or Mystery Babylon, can't beat ancient Iraq. Babylon mounts up to heaven and ascends above the heights of the clouds. 
These metaphors clearly reference a nation that has discovered flight. But the prophets have more to say about this end times nation. Babylon is hailed as a queen among nations, the lady of kingdoms. According to the prophets, Babylon reigneth over the kings of the earth. It is the praise of the entire earth and an astonishment among the nations. It is a place of great riches, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. In fact, the prophets say clearly that should something happen to Babylon, all worldwide trade would stop. The merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her because no one buys their cargoes anymore. It is the number one military power, and it's called the hammer of the whole earth. Isaiah in verse 18 chapter 2 talks about how Babylon's beginning would be unique and awe-inspiring. America was created out of the former British colonies, a nation made out of many states just like the prophets foretold. Our ancestors were the first British colonists and we speak their language. That's the reason why Jeremiah sees England like a mother to the US, according to verse 50 chapter 12. More so, the prophets talk about the lion that is on the sigil of the mother of Babylon. England uses the lion as its royal symbol. The last crew the prophets left us is incredibly accurate. The scripture often refers to Babylon as a woman. According to the book of Revelations, she sits atop water and has a golden cup in her right hand and a crown of seven rays on her head. And the woman which thou sawest in that great city, which reigneth over the kings of the earth. The United Nations, in theory, reigns over all the kings of the earth, and is situated in New York, the great city where you can see the Statue of Liberty. The statue is the most well-known landmark in the U.S., and the symbol of Babylon the prophets are referring to in their clues. So why then are they also calling it the Whore of Babylon? The sculptor of the Statue of Liberty was Auguste Bertoldi, a mason belonging to the Great Masonic Lodge in Paris. Before beginning the Statue of Liberty project, Bertoldi was seeking commission to construct a giant statue of the goddess Ishtar. The Romans also adopted this fertility goddess, but they changed the name to Libertas in Latin, Liberty in English. Libertas is the mythological equivalent of Ishtar. Therefore, the Statue of Liberty is in fact a statue of Ishtar, the Babylonian goddess of fertility, love, and sex. According to the ancient Babylonian rituals, one could only be purified of sin after intercourse with a temple priest or priestess of Ishtar. In return for this salvation, a gift offering was needed. Ishtar was the patron mother of the temple priestesses and priests. She was the mother of what we would call today prostitution. This is why Ishtar was seen by early Christians as the whore of Babylon. And that is why the Statue of Liberty, the symbol of America, is also called by the prophets, the whore of Babylon. Do you think it is just a coincidence that the U.S., the home of the greatest and most famous statue of Ishtar provides 65% of pornographic movies and adult entertainment to the world? Is it just another coincidence that this is the country where sexual liberation originated and spread to the rest of the world? It's not. It's just like the scriptures foretold. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The U.S. today has the most powerful economy and military, controls worldwide commerce, is proud and arrogant, has the most developed air force and space program, and it is the envy of the world. It houses the whore of Babylon. It reigns over the kings of the earth. And unfortunately for every living American, it is Mystery Babylon. This is what the prophets say about the great enemy of Babylon. For out of the north there cometh up a nation against her, which shall make her land desolate. They come from a far country, from the end of heaven, and the weapons of his indignation to destroy the whole land. Remember which country the prophet said was from the north? The same country that Ezekiel said will lead a great alliance of nations to the borders of Israel?
All three prophets tell of the fall of Babylon, the destruction of the United States of America as we know it. This is not an event that happened to ancient Babylon in the past. History has never recorded the fall of a state or a city in the way described by the prophets. What weapon could silence an entire continent in one hour? The world has never seen one until a few years ago with the creation of the Electromagnetic Pulse, or EMP. Over and over, think tanks like the EMP Commission, working for the Senate, have warned how this is the greatest and perhaps only real vulnerability of the United States. Yet no administration has done anything about it. We are completely unprepared for what's coming. Every report says the same thing. This event can wipe out 90% of Americans, and all it takes is just one warhead to be detonated above the United States to take us back to medieval times. The lasting effects will destroy society as we know it, exactly as the scriptures predicted. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine. Without hospitals or pharmacies being able to function, people won't be able to take their necessary medication. Without running water, heat, and garbage disposal, diseases will break out. As cars and trucks stop running, market shelves will become empty. Desperate people will become looters and there will be food riots. There will be no police, no law, no health care, no help. It will all descend into chaos and confusion. A complete collapse of everything we take for granted today. As the prophet Jeremiah says, And it shall be, when thou hast made an end of reading this book, that thou shalt bind it to a stone, and cast it into the midst of Euphrates. And thou shalt say, Thus shall Babylon sink, and shall not rise from the evil that it will bring upon her. And this is the start of the time of tribulation and sorrows. For then shall be a great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And yet, the prophet shows that there is still hope. But the ones who endures to the end will be saved. The message couldn't be any clearer. The warnings are there so that only the ones who believe the words and warnings of our Lord and prepare will be saved. San Bravo, we're reading 70 bogeys in your sector. Please verify. <laughs> Very funny station. That's a big negative over. Yeah, might be a glitch in one of the ACS modules. San Bravo, be advised running diagnostics to scan for malfunction. The skies are clear, Station. You've got yourself some phantom dots. Over. Zulu X-Ray 6, signs in your sector of some 100 bogeys. Please advise. Negatory, Station. Scope is clear. I don't know what to tell you. Solar interference, heavy sunspot activity today. Sierra Delta, uh, we may have a minor ACS fault here. Do you have anything on your scope? Sierra Delta, repeat. I'm looking at fighter jets over. Stand by, attempting to contact the nearest unit in that sector. All stations be advised. Satellite surveillance has been disabled. So you think we went to the moon? That's not what I asked you. I said, how much did you look into Do you think we that? went to the moon? Eddie now, there's a lot of people around, and I'm not up here to criticize anybody. There's a lot of people in this country who believe that if the government says it, it's got to be right. Yeah. <laughs> and there's a lot of people that believe if the doctor says it, he can't be wrong. And it, all you got to do if you're a thinking person is to find out that doctors don't agree. And you'd be amazed at how the government officials don't agree. I'm going to try to connect some dots for you. Hopefully we can connect some dots. Typical sheeple. There's an enormous turmoil in this world today. Listen carefully to what I have to say. Rising from the dust to the ashes of one civilization forms another one. These people firmly believe in occult signatures, occult dates, and the messages that's, in, that's, that's connected with these symbols and dates and times and places and people and so forth and so on. 
They're very important to them. The phoenix is the so-called mythological bird that rises out of the ashes of destruction. These people want to bring about a third world war. They are working overtime to bring a third world war to this planet. And out of that third world war of destruction and sorrow and death will rise a new civilization, a new world order that Herbert W. Bush talked about time and time and time again. If you knew what the people who lie in a casket at Yale University that belong to the Skull and Bone Society, if you knew what they did, you would be embarrassed to death right now. And I could not tell you from this pulpit what these people do. But I can tell you this. I can tell you that the elite at the top are connected and interconnected and it is a web, a system like you wouldn't believe. You are blown away at the enormity of what's going on with the people at the top, the elite, who are bringing about a third world war. And President George W. Bush is a bones man. A bones man is someone who belongs to the Skull and Bones Society from Yale University. And he, against the advice of many, sent our troops into Iraq chasing something that did not exist. That's right. Now, these are brave men that go into Iraq. I'll never forget reading in the article in the newspaper said at the gates of Fallujah. I don't know if you need to remember that or not, but it was entitled at the gates of Fallujah. Fallujah is a city in Iraq. Like, uh, like uh, it's a city in Iraq that was literally taken over by ISIS, by, by Al-Qaeda, by, by Muslim extremists, as they like to call them. And they were going to take that city. And the way they took that city was door to door, hand to hand, eyeball to eyeball, fighting by brave men. The politicians sent them in there. They died. Then the politicians turned around and handed Fallujah back to the very ones that, that they'd fought and died to take it from. So let me get this straight with you right now. It's not the military's fault. The military's not the one doing this. The military's not doing it. Will you listen? The man's name is William Guy Carr. He is a commander in the Royal Canadian Navy. William Guy Carr, remember that name. A commander in the Royal Canadian Navy in the intelligence section. Now, what's that mean? That qualifies this man to know things you don't know. That qualifies this man to have access to information you don't have access to. But it also tells you he's a very smart man. Very smart. And here's something else. He's a Christian. <laughs> I like William Guy Carr right off the bat. When you begin to read what the man wrote, he wrote a number of books. And you wouldn't believe the criticism and all of that that comes down on his head. And they really excoriate this man because he is a Christian and he is a, he's what do they call him? What do they call it? A, a, a conspiratist. If you believe in a conspiracy, you are immediately demonized in the eyes of people. This is part of the buzzword that goes out in our culture today. If you are a conspiracy, you believe that there's a conspiracy going on. Well, let me tell you something. Read Psalm chapter number two, and you'll find out that there is a conspiracy. And they've set themselves against our Lord Jesus Christ. And that conspiracy is real, folks. And let me tell you something. I believe there is a conspiracy going on. Yes, sir. I believe it. William Guy Carr spent his life researching the very thing that I'm going to talk about. And I'm telling you, he wrote books and he tried to get the information out. He wanted to warn people because he's a believer. He's my brother in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now he's gone on to be with the Lord now. I think he was born in the late 1800s and he, I think he died somewhere about 1960, 70, somewhere in there. And, and Brother Carr's gone on to be with the Lord. But I'm going to read an excerpt from one of his books. 
Would you bear with me now and listen to what this man has to say? You're not going to get this from CBS, NBC, and ABC. You're not going to get it from Fox and CNN. But here's what he said. He said, in 1834, the Italian revolutionary leader, Giuseppe Mazzini, was selected by the Illuminati to be director of their revolutionary program throughout the world. He held this post till he died in 1872. In 1840, General Albert Pike, you've all heard of him, was brought under the influence of Mazzini because he became a disgruntled officer when President Jefferson Davis disbanded his auxiliary Indian troops on the grounds they had committed atrocities under the cloak of legitimate warfare. Pike accepted the idea of a one world government and ultimately became head of the Luciferian priesthood. Between 1859 and 1871, he worked out the details of a military blueprint for three world wars. We're talking 1800s now. And three major revolutions which he considered would further the conspiracy to its final stage during the 20th century. Most of his work was done in a 13-room mansion he built in Little Rock, Arkansas in 1840. When the Illuminati and the lodges of the Grand Orient became suspect because of Mazzini's revolutionary activities in Europe, Pike organized the new and reformed Palladian Rite. He established three supreme councils, one in Charleston, South Carolina, one in Rome, Italy, and another in Berlin, Germany. Now listen carefully. He had Mazzini establish 23 subordinate councils, strategic locations throughout the world. These have been the secret headquarters of the world revolutionary movement ever since. Long before Ma Carney invented wireless radio, the scientists who were the Illuminati made it possible for Pike and the heads of his council to communicate secretly. It was the discovery of this secret that enabled the intelligence officers to understand how apparently unrelated incidents took place simultaneously throughout the world, which aggravated a situation and developed in a war of revolution. Meditate on that. Pike's plan was as simple as it has proved effective. He required that communism, Nazism, political Zionism, and other international movements be organized and used to foment the three global wars and three major revolutions. The first world war was to be fought so as to enable the Illuminati to overthrow the powers of the Tsar in Russia. He required that communism, Nazism, political Zionism, and other international movements be organized and used to foment the three global wars and three major revolutions. The first world war was to be fought so as to enable the Illuminati to overthrow the powers of the Tsar in Russia and turn that country into the stronghold of atheistic communism. Did that happen? The differences stirred up by the agenda of the Illuminati between the British and German empires were to be used to foment this war. After the war ended, communism was to be built up and used to destroy other governments and weaken religions. Did that happen? Yes, world War II was fomented, was to be fomented by using the differences between fascist and political Zionist. This war was to be fought so that Nazism would be destroyed and the power of political Zionism increased so that the sovereign state of Israel could be established in Palestine. Did that happen? During World War II, international communism was to be built up until it equaled in strength that of united Christendom. At this point, it was to be contained and kept in check until required for the final social cataclysm. That's the ashes rising up from the ashes. Can any informed person deny Roosevelt and Churchill did not put this policy into effect? No, they can't. Now remember now, here's a man writing about something, William Guy Carr, the researcher, writing about something that was happening in the 1800s. 
Satan said to the Lord, the kingdoms of this world I'll give to you if you'll just fall down and worship me. The only reason why their plans may not come to complete fruition is because he that now letteth will let till he be taken out of the way. Do you want to hear what World War III is about? World War III is to be fomented by using the differences the agentur of the Illuminati stir up between, watch this, political Zionist and the leaders of the Muslim world. Now, if I didn't say another thing, you could get up and walk out of this house today and say, good night, man. <laughs> They're doing it. They're doing it. Have you ever seen a time when Islam is such uproar as it is right now? The war is to be directed in such a manner that Islam, the Arab world, including Mohammedism, political Zionism, including the state of Israel, will destroy themselves while at the same time the remaining nations once more divided against each other on this issue will be forced to fight themselves into a state of complete exhaustion physically, mentally, spiritually, and economically. Boy, let me see. If Israel is in a fight to the death struggle with Islam and the other nations of the world are aligning themselves one way or another, that would be a good time for a peacemaker to step in and make a covenant, wouldn't it? And Israel would be willing to sign a covenant of peace knowing that they were at the precipice of destruction, right? Now, of course, this is not what, what, uh, what, what, Illumina, what uh, Pike had in mind. What Pike had in mind is to destroy them because he wants to bring in his new world order. But you see, God has a way of taking the plans of Satan and making them his own. Because he directs it exactly the way he wants it. You following that? God is the only one that can overrule wickedness and deceit and bring it to his own purpose and bring it to fruition. If I didn't say any more to you this morning, you'd have to go home and ask yourself this question. How in the world... In the 1800s, did they know anything about a conflagration that would involve the Muslims with well, Israel? Wasn't even a state in the 1800s. Where did this line of thought come from? How could this be transmitted down through time? And yet, this man, when he writes this, when this man writes this, he writes this based upon his own personal research into this stuff. And he spent his lifetime reading everything he could get a hold of. And that's the conclusion he came to, that they were planning three world wars and the third world war would involve the Muslim. Now, how many of this house this morning would have to say to yourself, you know, there could be a third world war. And shucks, if Iran were to launch a nuclear weapon, boy, we could have a, a real war, couldn't we? And our illustrious president has handed them the kitchen so that they can build a nuclear weapon. Who knows? I've heard, I've read some material. Some, you know, all we know is what we read. I'm not, up, I'm not at the top up there talking with these guys. Some say they've already got a nuclear weapon. So who knows? I don't know. I don't know. Listen to this. Albert Pike wrote a letter to Mazzini. And this letter uh, was intercepted. And it is this letter to Mazzini that we're talking about here, this most controversial thing in the world, because here's what's said. This letter was supposed to have been on display in the British, I think the British Museum or somewhere up in there. And, 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 and Carr took the word of someone who had been there to see it and read it, and he, and he authenticated his work based on that. And then come to find out, the British Museum comes out now and says that the letter never existed. And hold on. How many of you ever heard that people have found artifacts out here? Found artifacts, sent them to the Smithsonian Institute. How many of you have ever heard that the Smithsonian, if it's an artifact that does not support their evolution, they'll put it on a barge and send it out into the Atlantic Ocean and dump it? Yeah. Yeah. Do you know who I'm going to believe? I'm going to believe the Christian. 
Do you know what I'm going to believe? I'm going to believe that troop, that trooper, that commander in the field in a heartbeat over a politician. You've got to get to the point, folks, where just because they say it doesn't exist or this or that, remember who you're listening to. You can't trust anybody today. But if you know he's a born again brother and your spirit witnesses with his spirit, you can trust him. It's like me. I'm up here preaching to you this morning. Can you trust me? Can you trust what I'm saying? You know, I don't get $500,000 a lecture. <laughs> Wall Street, I had, they've never invited me to come up and lecture Goldman Sachs. <laughs> nope, doesn't happen. Now, <laughs> here's a quote from Pike. He says, we shall unleash the nihilist, the atheist, we shall provoke a formidable social cataclysm, which in all its horror will show clearly to the nations of the effect of absolute atheism. Watch carefully this wording. Origins of savagery and of the most bloody turmoil. Then everywhere the citizens obliged to defend themselves against the world minority of revolutionaries will exterminate those destroyers of civilization and the multitude disillusioned with Christianity whose deistic spirits will be from that moment without compass, direction, anxious for an ideal but without knowing where to render its adoration will receive the true light through the universal manifestation of the pure doctrine of Lucifer brought finally out in the public view. Boy, let me put it in simpler terms. Pike is not an atheist. Atheism has been running rampant. He says that by bringing about this third world war, that he will show to humanity what atheism and agnosticism produces. They'll get the blame for it. And that the true faith in Lucifer, who is the true light, is the only salvation for man. And that people will be disillusioned with their church. They'll hate the whore, Revelation 17. They're disillusioned with the church. They're disillusioned with atheism. They're disillusioned with agnosticism. They're disillusioned with all of it. So they'll turn to Lucifer. Now, Lucifer doesn't have two horns. He doesn't have hooves on his feet. He doesn't carry a pitchfork. He's the most beautiful, wise one you ever met. You never met one who knows man like Lucifer and has the answer for your problems and for the problems of the world. And let me tell you how he shows up. He shows up in Pike and Mazzini's man. Their man will be energized by the power of Lucifer. The whole world will say we're sick and tired of wars. We're sick of wars. We're sick of killing. We're sick of atheism and agnosticism. That's what brought the war about. And you are going to lead us into an age of peace. That's what Pike is talking about. The whole world will say we're sick and tired of wars. We're sick of wars. We're sick of killing. We're sick of atheism and agnosticism. That's what brought the war about. And you are going to lead us into an age of peace. That's what Pike is talking about. And that's what they, implant, that's what they intend to do. And that's where we're headed right now. This is an amazing thing. I'm going to jump forward. And here's what Pike says. And you've heard me say it many times. He says, what do we say to the crowd? He said, we worship God. He said, but it is the God that one worships without superstition. The religion should be by all of us initiates in the higher degrees maintained in the purity of the Luciferian doctrine. Yes, Lucifer is God. That's what Pike says. Pike was a Luciferian, folks. And he's not the only one around. So 9-11 was a tool scripted long ago to bring the needed chaos for the birth of a new world order. Now, I didn't say that in the 1800s that they had written on paper that they're going to bring down these two towers. What I said was that they were going to intervene and interfere into the, into the, into the culture of mankind, whatever it takes, whatever it takes to bring about the chaos. And believe me, they're doing it. 
a one world government. These Luciferians have been seeking it for centuries. Now it is said that on September the 23rd, the Pope is to proclaim the God of the new ecumenical religion in Jerusalem, in the old city of Jerusalem. I haven't had enough time to research this. I don't know if any of you have or not. But it would be, it would be use, worthwhile to check into this, to find out just exactly what's going on with this Pope. But if he does, and he reveals their new God, the God that can bring all the religions together, it would not be, it would not surprise me one bit that the God that he reveals is Lucifer. But he'll reveal him in a different manner. He's not going to say he's Lucifer. Not yet. But this is the religion of the Antichrist. He'll rise to power out of the ashes of destruction. This is the last thing I'm going to read to you this morning. This is the Jerusalem Post, okay? This is not some nutball out here on the internet. Just replaying what somebody else said. This is the Jerusalem Post. All right? How many of you have ever read the Jerusalem Post? All right, and there's another newspaper. It's, a bigger, it's bigger than the Post. It's called the Jewish Press. And these are, these are mainstream news outlets from Israel. The Jerusalem Post. Pope Francis is aligning himself against Israel. This came from the Post. That's what they said. That's the headline. That this present Pope has made it clear whose side he's on. What does that say to the Jew? That says to the Jew in Israel... We'd better, we'd better lock and load. We'd better get ready. We'd better prepare. Because they know the history of the Roman Catholic Church. I know Americans don't, but the Jews do. The Jews do. Most Americans don't have a clue, but the Jews do. Listen to this. And given its sordid history of anti-Semitism, book burnings, forced conversions, and inquisitions, the Catholic Church should think a hundred times over before daring to step on Israel's, and I couldn't get the print on it, probably its sovereignty. If anything, the Pope should be down on his knees pleading for forgiveness from the Jewish people and atonement from the Creator for what the Vatican has wrought over the centuries. That's strong, dog. The current attempt to undermine and deny Israel's rights to Judea and Samaria by recognizing the Palestinian statehood smacks of super secession or replacement theology, a doctrine according to which the church replaced Israel as God's chosen instrument nearly 2,000 years ago. What's all this? The Pope on Michael Frund wrote this article, 5-18-2015. Pope Francis has declared a Palestinian state. Now, I don't know if y'all realize how big a deal that is. The leader of over a thousand million Catholics has declared that there is a Palestinian state, a sovereign entity of the, Palest the so-called Palestinian people that is a Palestinian state. The United States government hasn't done that. You've heard an argument over the two-state solution, two-state solution. How many of you heard that ad nauseum? Two-state solution, two-state solution. That's what it's about. It's about declaring the Palestinians to have a Palestinian state. The Jew will come back and tell you in a heartbeat, there's not going to be a Palestinian state until they, until they, until they acknowledge the right of Israel to exist as a nation. And they haven't done that. They're going to destroy them. Hamas is funded by Iran. Hezbollah is funded by Iran. And they will destroy Israel at the very moment they think they can. What's happening? They're stirring the pot. They're getting ready for their man and for this conflagration that's coming. Folks, a war is right around the corner. And this man of sin, the Antichrist, is about to step out onto the stage of time. And he is Lucifer incarnate in flesh. He's the very devil incarnate in flesh. And let me tell you what all that means for you. That means 
according to 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2, that when you see that man of sin revealed, get ready, we're leaving out of here. Amen. Just like that. Amen. Hallelujah. I've never known a time like this. Now, if you can prove that the letter to Mazzini is a forgery and that Albert Pike never said that in the 1800s and say that all of this is just a bunch of hyped up stuff by, 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 by conspiracy theorists, then you can rest assured that you'll be hunky-dory and everything goes on just fine. But you can't do that. You cannot prove that that's a forgery. Just the contrary. William Guy Carr a commander in the Royal Navy, in the Royal Canadian Navy, an intelligence officer, very smart, bright Christian man, firmly believed that that letter existed and that Albert Pike had said these things and it was coming to pass exactly because he didn't base it all on that. He did his research and his homework and he said, we're getting ready for World War III and it'll be with the Muslims. Have a nice day. <laughs> Father, in Jesus' name, I pray, Lord, for what I've said. It'll be help those that won't help. It'll give light to those who want light. It'll give direction to those who are seeking direction. It'll wake up those, Father, who want to be wakened. Our Heavenly Father, it'll direct those who need direction. It'll bless those who need to be blessed. But our Father, I am not going to pray today for God to bless America in its sleep and its rebellion and in the kind of nation that this has turned into when we're killing babies and we're promoting homosexuality. No, Lord, I'm going to pray for you to bless America if it repents, if it gets right with God. I'll pray for you to bless America with the preaching of the gospel and for men and women, Lord, to turn back to thee and turn to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's where I would love to see America blessed. But no way in the world, Lord, would I ask you to bless a nation that is in absolute rebellion against you. And that's where America is now. Father, I pray that America would be awakened. I love my country, Lord. I love it. But our Heavenly Father, this that I'm talking about and this nation, this ancient people, this ancient nation of Israel, our Heavenly Father in biblical prophecy is far, far, far more important than whether America exists or not. And I pray this now in Jesus' name. And for Jesus' sake we ask it. And amen. What benefit do I get in believing we went to the moon? What go. benefit? Is it going to benefit me? Dude, you've been fucking fooled. Everyone's been fooled. Think about all the lies. The lies go deep. You know what people think like, oh, flat earth and the moon landing, that's a distraction from the real conspiracy theories? That's what I used to think. You know what I think? I think those conspiracy theories, the, 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 main, the, the mainstream conspiracies, are a distraction for the real conspiracy, where we're on, Let's what we're there. on. They're trying to keep God from us. They're trying to keep the creator from us. They're making us insignificant when this is a special fucking place. Ron. Who knows what shape it is? They're trying to keep God from us. They're trying to keep the creator from us. They're making us insignificant. A conspiracy to hide this information that DNA is a Fibonacci is an exemplification of this number called, or entity uh, ratio sequence called the uh, golden ratio, the ratio that proves the existence of intelligent design or the uh, reality of intelligent design of the cosmos. I mean, if you go to the golden ratio site for Wikipedia 2 on the same theme, um, <laughs> they don't mention any of this stuff in nature that we're going to talk about here that we talked about on the show two days ago and that we're talking about here. They talk about how it's found in architecture and math and all this kind of stuff. They don't discuss it, how it's found in the measurements of the human arm. Why not? It's just, it's, it, I mean, well, I think I'm making, that's the point here. I think that just made sense to me, thinking this through as I say it to you. It has to be a conspiracy. How could all this be overlooked and how could Wikipedia leave it out? It's, it can't be, it has to be somehow that big money has pushed their influence uh, somehow and they've had a drive to keep this covered up or something. These can't all be coincidences. And since they're doing that with everything else, it has to be the case that uh, there's some movement to keep this stifled. I mean, why isn't... In, here's another 
piece to add to this. Why isn't this in our education system? We learn all this junk geometry, pea brain stuff when you take geometry in high school, and they don't teach you about any of this? The golden ratio everywhere in nature? I, I went through elementary school, you know, high school, college, uh, you know, undergrad degree in college, uh, master's degree, and halfway through PhD, and never was this any of this mentioned. And we know who controls the universities, uh, the big money behind it, all the way up to the Illuminati Nephilim uh, controllers. So this can't be. This is planned, okay? And you just wonder. It's got. I mean, I'm almost concluding here in my mind. This Davidson college site showing up number one in Google all the time and first page and Wikipedia having the strange measurements which don't correlate with all kinds of these examples from academic sites I'm finding and I'm putting them all pictures of the uh, screenshots in the newsletter um, it's got to be a conspiracy I mean we could keep going compiling the evidence it would just all lead to it so and that and if we could keep compiling evidence of it being a conspiracy I mean, everything points towards it. I'm just throwing ideas off the top of my head. These strange sites show up at the top. Wikipedia is wrong. It's covered up completely in, in the best-selling books about the Golden Ratio, which come from uh, wealthy university professors. It's uh, the universities and the education, government-controlled education system absolutely covers it up. You see how I mean everything's falling in the same direction. You know, the, so when everything, uh, all these conclusions point to the same direction that it's covered up and hidden. So Jerusalem is the holiest of sites. It's the omphalos, or the navel of the world. Because it's where, in the Christian conception, it's where Jesus and the disciples worked, right? Where they walked, where they ministered. So the end of the book of the Revelation shows the vision of the heavenly Jerusalem. And this is supposed to be the, the focal point for this new world, in a lot of ways. This new society, where all the suffering and all the death and all the tears of the old order are wiped away. So Jerusalem plays an important role, both physically, but also symbolically. Jerusalem is ground zero for the apocalypse. All of the end time prophecies center on this very city. And it looks like everything is getting ready to go into play for the fall of 2017, which is the Jubilee year according to the ancient calendar. A Jubilee year occurs every 50 years within a certain time frame on the biblical calendar seven years seven times to get to what is known as the year of jubilee and the year of jubilee biblically is when all deaths were canceled and all the land returned back to the original owner uh, many people believe that god will return in a year of jubilee because in leviticus 25 god says all the earth is mine the land will not be sold forever and so many believe that it will be some year in a jubilee cycle that god will return and reclaim the earth i live in a jewish community in the galilee and I was given a manuscript concerning the prophecy of a 13th century Jewish sage, a rabbi, Judah the Righteous. He said that for 400 years, eight jubilees, the Ottoman Turks would rule Jerusalem. Then it would be no man's land for one jubilee. And then the next jubilee, it would be in the hands of the Jewish nation. And then the next jubilee would be the beginning of the end time messianic age. In 1217, Judah the Righteous spoke these words. 300 years, six jubilee periods later, in 1517, the Ottoman Turks took Jerusalem. They held it for 400 years, exactly eight jubilees to 1917. That is when General Allenby took Jerusalem. It immediately, under the guidance and the directive of the League of Nations, the predecessor to the United Nations, was labeled no man's land. Exactly the words of Judah the Righteous hundreds and hundreds of years earlier. And for one Jubilee was no man's land, and then the Jewish nation, which had not been for nearly 2,000 years, took Jerusalem and has now held it in 2017 according to Judah the Righteous, begins the end time messianic age. 
this is the 50th year or Jubilee anniversary for Jerusalem, but also we have the 70th anniversary of Israel becoming a nation. These are right on top of each other. Could something happen prophetically this year? When we come to the end of September, that is when we are expecting the full-scale invasion in the war against Israel. According to the prophets, and the prophet Zechariah specifically, he told us exactly what he saw by revelation. He saw cylindrical shaped objects, flying objects that have an evil fire offering encased in lead sent from the land of Shinar, which is modern day Iran, Iraq, Syria, against the land of Israel. And these flying containers that he saw 2,400 years ago are the exact dimensions of a modern day Scud missile. And this thing is all ramping up for this full scale war. Yeshua told John to write down the things that he's just seen, the things which are now, and the things that will come to pass in the future. He sees Yeshua rip off seven seals from the scroll, and the events that play out on the earth are cataclysmic. We see death happen. We see a great sword. We see biological warfare, famine, and pestilence, disease. We see the sky roll back and clouds roll up that darken out the sun, moon, and stars. Very clearly what we would think of as thermal nuclear war. You read about cities being destroyed, you know, in a blink of an eye, in an instant, in an hour, uh, destruction comes. You read about the fire, you read about men's skin melting off their bones and things like that. I mean, for somebody who had no concept of really of explosives, and fire like we make fire now in the modern times. I think if you just look at it with a clear mind and say, what was John really talking about when he tried to describe these visions that he had? It's obviously, to me, it's obviously nuclear war. If we're focused on Israel in the spotlight, yeah, there's gonna be nuclear war there. People who study the Middle East, they say the whole thing is like a big powder keg. There's fuses all over the place. We're just waiting for one of them to get lit. Since Israel became a nation, they have fought many wars, and they're always on guard against another war. And if you track any of that news, well, it looks like it could happen any moment. It's that volatile. Iran has said openly, the leader, that when they get a nuke, they are going to nuke Israel. The one nation that the prophets say is going to nuke Israel in the last days. Qatar has one nuclear warhead that we know of. They, they have one but they are in the hands of the radicals that want to nuke Israel. We could see this thing turn around very quickly. And as we see in the book of the Revelation that this great sword is given, a great sword, and this great sword is going to take peace from the earth and is going to cause people to kill each other. This is the most exciting time that has ever been in the history of mankind. And when these wars start happening and the nukes start flying, it's like, okay, hold on. This is going to be one wild ride. And I want to be here in this city when this whole thing comes down. I want to be. There's nothing wrong with us looking at these things and saying, here are these patterns. This looks like this pattern is now all stacking up. 1917, General Allenby takes Jerusalem. 1967, 50 years later, one Jubilee. The nation of Israel, which didn't exist in 1917, took Jerusalem. 2017 being the next Jubilee. Well, that Jubilee also happens to be 70 years from when Israel became a nation in one day, fulfilling the 2600 year old prophecy of Isaiah. When we see all these patterns in place, we have to say that this may be the hand of the Almighty. It could be coincidence, but I think we'd be foolish to just brush it all aside as just coincidence. We need to open our eyes and see if the Almighty is not telling us something. What's a sign? You know, they take many forms, but certainly signs in the sky have always been signs from the Father. And there are some amazing things going on in the sky.
It's not surprising that people would pay attention to the sky. It is, in fact, half of the environment. One of the things that people notice, besides the incredible grandeur and beauty of something like the night sky, or the majesty and the predictability of the phases of the moon and the sunrises and the sunsets, is the fact that the sky is a convenient source of... They saw the stars come and go in different seasons, and those were all keys to survival, because those seasonal changes signaled the need or change for food, shelter, clothing, resources. And so just about everybody depended on the sky one way or another. The tradition of using the stars and the constellations and so forth in the ancient Hebrew culture started in Genesis chapter 1. And it says that God himself placed stars and signs in the heavens and the atmosphere. The Jewish people later formed their calendar on astronomical observations and the sighting of the new moon every month from Jerusalem. But, very interestingly, the Old Testament, the Hebrew Old Testament, calls a series of feasts in the book of Leviticus a moed, M-O-E-D. And these are appointed times that God deals with people on the earth or the Jewish people himself. In Leviticus 23, the father tells Moses to tell the Israelites that he's got a calendar and he's got appointments on them. And he sums them up, there are seven appointments. There's Passover, there's unleavened bread, there's first fruits, there's Pentecost, there's the Feast of Trumpets, there's the Feast of Atonement, and there's the Feast of Tabernacles. All of Israel's feast days have to do with the phases of the moon. Some of the feasts will be started on the new moon. So the moon is extremely important in the feast days. As a matter of fact, Passover has to have a full moon. The feast days are highly related to apocalyptic events, to the book of Revelation. We cannot understand the book of Revelation or the apocalypse without understanding the feast days. The book of the Revelation is the Messiah fulfilling the fall feast of the Lord. All those things that we were to rehearse that the scriptures speak of uh, from Yom Truah, the day of trumpets, day of shouting, uh, through Yom Kippur and the feast of Sukkot or the feast of tabernacles, it is all there embedded in there and it's all in the book of the Revelation. The Creator runs the universe according to His time clock, whether we recognize it, live by it, understand it or not, makes no difference to Him. The next feast that needs to be fulfilled is the Feast of Trumpets, and then after that, the Feast of Atonement, and then after that, the Feast of Tabernacles. An eclipse is when one body goes in the shadow of another, or one body blocks out all or part of another. So an eclipse of the sun is when the moon goes between us and the sun. An eclipse of the moon is when the moon goes into the shadow of the earth. And these things happen uh, five or six times a year. They're very ordinary. God said he created the sun and the moon for signs. What greater sign could that have meant but solar and lunar eclipses? While eclipses are natural phenomena, what gives them prophetic significance is when they happen on the biblical calendar and when we look scientifically at the patterns of when they have occurred historically. And back in 2014 and 2015, I originally discovered that there were these four total lunar eclipses falling on the biblical holy days, two years in a row, back to back. So I did research to find out when was the last time this happened. And I noticed the last time it happened was 1967 when Israel recaptured Jerusalem. Hello, these are very prophetically significant. And then the time before that was right after they became a nation in 1948. And then the time before that was 1492 when all the Jews were kicked out of Spain because of the Spanish Inquisition. So all I did was connect the dots between NASA, when the eclipses occur, with the biblical calendar, and then it comes to, okay, what is the prophetic meaning? The blood red moon is not uncommon in itself, but they are uncommon when they fall on feast days exactly, especially in tetrads, having four of them within a span of a year or two. 
I think the celestial events are kind of like parables. Jesus taught parables and he hid truths in those parables. I think that's the exact same thing with celestial events. Just as if you're driving down the road and you see a sign that says the bridge is out, it better not be where the bridge is out. It better be a mile ahead to give you warning. So for me, these signs in the heavens were warning us about what is coming over the next several years. The Great American Eclipse is something that is fairly rare. We are going to see a total solar eclipse in August of 2017 come across America from the state of Washington to the state of Georgia. The total eclipse is going to be amazing. It's going to be the first time in decades that we've had a total eclipse that's visible over most of the continental United States. Total eclipses happen fairly regularly on the Earth. I mean, every other year, approximately, there's going to be a total eclipse somewhere on the Earth. But, you know, most of the Earth is water. A lot of the Earth is not very well populated. This is the first event in most people's lifetimes where it's visible to millions of people. Almost anyone in the United States could drive and within a day be on the path of totality. So this is a big deal. Every culture for thousands of years have looked at eclipses as a warning from God or from the heavens. Well, what you have to do is look at the pattern. In 763 BC, Jonah was sent to Nineveh. Jonah was an Old Testament prophet who was commissioned by God to go to Nineveh. Nineveh is today currently Mosul. It was a very ungodly area, it was pagan, and he was told to go and bring him to repentance. And Nona balked at that, and didn't want to go, and rebelled, and went the opposite way. After he is swallowed by what the Bible says is a great fish, he is vomited back up on the beach, and he now goes to Nineveh. And when he finally goes there, the entire city repents, the Bible says, in sackcloth and ashes, including the king. There was a big plague that affected the entire city of Nineveh. As a matter of fact, the king couldn't even go out to war in the spring as kings normally do. This was followed by a civil war, which was followed by another plague. And then in that summer, you have this total solar eclipse that goes over Nineveh. So all the Ninevites, they are scared to death having had a plague, a civil war, another plague, and now this total solar eclipse. Nineveh is recorded to have had the Bur Sagal eclipse of 763 BC. The thing that may have made Nineveh repent uh, could have been that total solar eclipse. Jonah arrives on the biblical calendar the first day of Elul. Now that is going to be around September 1st. And in the Bible, that month is known as the month of repentance. Now what many people don't realize, this warning was a 40 day warning. Well, that leads you to Yom Kippur, the day of atonement, which is also the day of judgment when God judges the nations. And so here we have on August 21st of 2017, a total solar eclipse that just so happens to occur on the first of Elul, the very beginning of the month of repentance that is leading up to the Day of Atonement or Yom Kippur. This has to be more than coincidence. The sun, as far as a total solar eclipse, refers to judgment coming upon the nations. When was the last time we had a total solar eclipse that completely crossed the United States. Did you know it was at the end of World War I? And here we have America involved in World War I. Many people don't realize World War I also began with a total solar eclipse that went all through Eastern Europe through Turkey, and even went all the way through Nineveh. And what do we see happened? 
the Ottoman Empire is destroyed and the solar eclipse went right through the Ottoman Empire. So we see a pattern of judgment. Interestingly enough, Jesus said that a generation towards the end, asking about the end of time, Jesus said they will be given the sign of Jonah. Maybe it's talking about an eclipse. And if that's the case, then America needs to take warning. Something that's very interesting about the year 2017 is that it seems to fulfill a number of different generational numbers in the scriptures. The Hebrew date of 5777 is the year 2017. That number seven is significant in scripture. All numbers in scripture have significance and symbolism. Seven is the perfect number. It's the number of God. It's the number that uh, we associate with perfection. A triple seven is just like a triple six, 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 which is the number of man, number of evil. Uh, in triad form, it reemphasizes the perfection of God. If we look at 2017 as year zero, and we look at Israel, and what's been happening to Israel years ago to come back into her land, it seems to have started 120 years ago. A man named Theodore Herzl held a Congress in Basel, Switzerland in 1897. And the Lord himself is going to do this astonishing thing. He's going to, the people there will be astonished when they see how he responds and saves them. But look what also we find in this, in this chapter. We see darkness. In that day the deaf shall hear in the word the words of the book, and out of the gloom and darkness the eyes of the blind shall see. So if I go back to the sixth seal, the next thing is the sun the sun will turn black as sackcloth, and the moon become like blood. We see that right there. And what I would say about this, a lot of people have looked at this and said, Oh, that's a that's gonna be a um, a solar eclipse or a lunar eclipse at the same time. Because it happens on the day of a full moon. This is a this is a one day event, or it starts on a day, and the sun will be black and the moon will be like blood. So you can't have a solar eclipse and a lunar eclipse at the same time. So my thoughts are when the great earthquake occurs, volcanoes go off, ash goes up in the sky, and the volcanic ash surrounds the world, and it causes the sun to be black, black as sackcloth, and the moon to turn like blood. When there's been other volcanic eruptions, the uh, full moon has turned out and looked like blood. So this to me is not a solar or lunar eclipse. It also says it occurs on a full moon. This implies that it's the 14th day of the lunar month. So full moons are always on the 14th day. If you go to the calendar and show you literally the instant that the moon is full, uh, the way the, the, the Jewish calendar or the lunar calendar works, it's the 14th day of the month. And you know, just the question is, what else happens on the 14th day? What other thing happens on the 14th day of the month on God's calendar? Well, Passover is the only uh, feast or Moedim or appointed time that occurs on the 14th day. Okay, now there's, there's the Feast of Tabernacles, which occurs on the 15th day to the 21st day, but that's not, this is the 14th day. And that would be in the springtime. So it doesn't have to be on that 14th day in the springtime, but that's what it says. Now there's 12 months a year, 12 lunar months a year, so there could be one of 12. But look what it says here about these fig trees. It says, and the stars will fall to the earth as the fig tree sheds its winter fruit when it's shaken by a gale. So fig trees have two crops and they have an early spring crop. It's called a breba or breba crop. And the breba crop is the winter fruit that grew through the winter, that's why it's called winter fruit, and it's ready, it becomes ripe in the spring. An unripe fig, one which not ripening in due time, grows through the winter and falls off in the spring. So the text from Revelation 6 is telling us that it appears to be a springtime event. The stars will fall from the earth to the earth as, like metaphors, a fig tree sheds its winter fruit, which is in the springtime. Okay, and the thing about these, this first crop, this first, first fruits crop from this fig tree, is these figs are few, not many of them, and they taste, they're sour, they have a bad message or a bad taste. 
and they have a tough skin. So I, th I think these things really emulate the first fruits, 144,000. So here we are, 14th day of the month in the springtime. Then we learn, it says, every mountain and island will move out of its place. So if everything on the entire earth is going to shake, ground, mountains, everything. This is going to have to be a huge cataclysmic event that's coming to the planet, to earth. So I would offer up and say that this seems to be something to do with Planet X or the Planet X system or the Revelation 12 sign, which is the second the second sign of Revelation. We've already looked at this a million times, guys. And we can compare Revelation 12 and Revelation 6 and look what it says. It says, And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon, seven heads and ten heads. Now this other sign, this great red dragon, is this... Um, Planet X star, the brown dwarf star with seven planets. We've all heard this before. The leaked NASA scientists have all just given this away. It's a brown dwarf star about one eighth the diameter of our own sun. It's got seven planets and a bunch of moons. That's what that is. This, these, these planets and this star, this brown dwarf star that emits infrared radiation. It's got this big planet. We all talk about Planet X from the Biru. It's going to make a showing and this is that second sign. And it's going to cause darkness somehow. Look what it says. And his tail swept a third of the stars of heaven, cast them to the earth. Cast them to the what else is cast to the earth with the sixth seal? What it says here. And the stars of the sky fell to the earth. They were cast to the earth. It's the same thing. Now these stars can mean angels, because angels come later in Revelation 12. Okay. So we can see this every mountain moving out of its place. I see that as the great red dragon causing havoc on the earth. That's where it gets interesting now. The kings and the great ones will cry, fall on us, hide us. They want to hide in the mountains and the rocks. I would say they're going to go run and hide in their deep underground military bases that they've built. That's why we're $20 trillion in debt. But if you look at this phrase, fall on us, cover us, this is in two other places in scripture. The same phrase. Jesus himself mentions this. Luke 23. See, you gotta take these clues. Jesus literally says the same exact thing. Yeah. Um, so daughters of Jerusalem, this is this is Jesus speaking as he's carrying his cross to Golgotha to be crucified. Jesus says, Behold, the days are coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren of Blessed are the barren. And the wombs that never bore or the breasts that never nursed. Then they will be given, then they will begin to say to the mountains, fall on us and, and to the hills, cover us. So Jesus is literally, now Jesus said this before John had this vision, but um, Jesus said this before. And then if we go to what John said, what John wrote in Revelation, he says, and the kings of the earth and the great ones of the generals and the rich and the powerful, Slave and free, they'll say, hide themselves in the cave and among the rocks, calling out to the rocks, fall on us and hide us from him who is seated on the throne. So I go back to Hosea 10, where we also see this. Let me just go back here and show you how this works, guys. This is so simple to do. If anybody can just look at this stuff. Look, fall on us. Let's go here. So we saw it in Revelation, right? Fall on us. We see it in Luke, right? Here, fall on us. That's Jesus speaking. Now we're going to go to Hosea. Now you can go look somewhere else. It won't be the same because it's not, you won't see literally fall on us. But if you go back to Hosea, we see the same darn thing. This is Jesus quoting this prof this prophet, Hosea from Beth, chapter 10, verse 8. Let's go here and look. Okay, look what it says. Ephraim shall be put to shame, and Israel shall be ashamed of his idol. Samaria's king shall perish like a twig on the face of the waters. The high places of Avon, the sin of Israel, shall be destroyed. Thorn and thistle shall grow up on the altars, and they shall say to the mountains, Cover us into the hills, fall on us. Okay? So here I'm going to say it Hosea 10, verse 8. Revelation 6, the sixth seal. And Jesus' references in Luke 23, they are all describing the same exact event, which is the sixth seal. Revelation 6, the sixth seal, is exactly the same time as this in Hosea 10, verse 8. And look what happens to Samaria's king. Now, you guys have been with me long enough. You know what I know about the United States. 
in the book of prophecy. Uh, where do I have this? Do I have this? I don't think I have it here, guys. You know, I've talked about this in the past, how Israel is the Western nations, guys, and Ephraim is the USA, and the capital of Ephraim is Samaria. So when you see this, I'm jumping around here, guys. When you see this, Samaria is like Washington, D.C. Okay, the king in Washington, D.C. shall perish when they say, cover us and fall on us, which is the sixth seal. Okay, Ephraim is the USA. Okay. So what does it say down here? It says um, it says some terrible things here, guys. I don't know how to explain this, but it says this. It says this. It says that mothers will, will dashed in pieces with their children. And we're going to see that in Enoch. Same thing. Enoch makes exactly the same reference to this, guys. Okay. So I kind of gave it away. Kerr knocking into the White House. It can be taken out at the sixth seal. I don't know if you can pick it any other way. Samaria is the modern representation of Washington, D.C. Ephraim is USA. Okay. We also learn uh, that the wrath of the land begins at the sixth seal. And Paul says we're not appointed the wrath. That's what it says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9. So those who have sacrificed themselves and given themselves over as a living sacrifice, when the sixth seal comes, they will be kept from this terrible time of trial that will come upon all those who dwell on the face of the earth. You guys know that. Revelation 3.10. The church of Philadelphia will not be here for this. All right. So what do we learn? We learn the bottom line is this. The sixth seal will occur in the springtime, it appears, on a full moon, which is the 14th day of the month, the spring month. But yet there's more clues to continue on. 